Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of of podcast on D Shot. Or hey everybody, welcome to another episode of podcast on D Shot. And with football season right around the corner, I'm glad to welcome on the head coach of the UW Whitewater football program, Kevin Bullis, as him and his Warhawk squad gear up for the 2021 season and another push towards another deep postseason run as they start their 2021 campaign with a matchup I've been waiting for for 10 years, hoping to get some bragging rights over my brother and some other people at Carthage um, as they open up against Carthage at Perkins Stadium on September 4th. Thanks, Coach, for being on. Hey, thank you for having me, Daniel. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so how does it feel, kind of like a little bit of a rock band question here, how does it feel to kind of have the team back um, and specifically in game mode this season after a year off of not playing games? Um, to say it's exciting is an understatement in, in all reality, Daniel. I mean, it's, um, you know, the kids, um, as much for them as it is for us. Um, but to be in that mode of, you know, we, we trained last year and we were able to work with our players uh, 92 times is what we did. We were actually uh, NCAA allowed us 114 opportunities. And um, that was great. I mean, we were we were with them. We were training. They were busting their tails. It was awesome. But to now to have that uh, test day at the end of the week, you know, because that's what it is once we get into the regular season is, is test day once a week and the excitement, the fun of that, uh, the perk is packed and, and all those experiences that the kids have. Um, and the coaches, <laughs> it's not just them, um, that it, it is um, very thrilling. Okay, with those practices in the fall and spring and along with that scrimmage that you guys had in the spring, um, how much more did that kind of allow you to look at the program as a whole and what players can bring, especially when the next couple of years are going to be kind of a little bit more impactful in terms of like, seeing how some of the underclassmen are going to um, be towards the next couple of years. How much did that help with depth for this year and the seasons coming up? You know, and that's that's a great, great point. I mean, it, and it does. It helps with depth. It's helping everybody with depth. I mean, in, in all reality. And, and, and so for us, I mean, um, you know, we had um, we got a number of young men that would have been seniors last fall that are here this fall. And so right there in itself to have that veteran, um, basically guys that are in their fifth year of the program, um, one at the helm of the leadership, um, two that to have their skills on the, on, on the field. And, uh, and I think every other program is feeling that same way. I mean, you're, 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 there's gonna be some great uh, WIC football this year. There's gonna be some great D3 football. There's gonna be great D2, I mean, at every level I think you're truly going to see um, just some fantastic play, level of play, and, and very competitive games. Um, this other thing was another thing that kind of was a neat little thing last this past year um, was that you had Jeff J. Gazinski, the former Packers offensive coordinator, guy that's worked with Aaron Rodgers, Brett Favre, and Michael Vick, um, and been at all these le different levels of football from high school to playing at D3 and um, coaching at the, the D3 division, being a head coach at division at the division one level, being, in, being part of an XFL staff at one point. Um, how big was that to have him briefly on the staff last year? And how did that help on the offensive side of the ball with having that kind of voice? You know, and that's um, Coach Jay Gazinski giving us our, his time last fall. He was with us last fall. And um, having that wisdom, those experiences, Daniel, I mean, that, 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 that's what it is. It, it's, it's that wisdom of experiences that he's had and obviously an extremely intelligent person and, and very successful in the profession um, it was helpful to everybody, whether it was sitting in the big room and seeing how we were doing things from you know from a macro aspect of our program, or to you know sitting down with Brent Allen, our offensive line coach, and talking basic fundamentals of technique and, and the basic concepts of protections, and and so I mean that's the beauty of a, a person like him is is he gives you that um, wealth uh, is what it is a very broad wealth 
of knowledge and, and wisdom to to our program. And so we were we soaked up everything we could during the time that he was here. He wasn't here the entire fall, but a good portion of it. And and uh, we took advantage of every minute we had with him, Daniel. How did that kind of benefit the other coaches on the set? We talked about Brent Allen. Um, obviously, Pete Jennings is your offensive coordinator. So how did it kind of help? Uh, from their side of things? Not a question because, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, he, one, he gives them an analytical eye in the, in the sense of how we're doing things um, schematically on the offensive side of the ball. And, and that that is beautiful and, and be able to see, um, have his input, his advice on those things. And also just the idea of, you know, as anything with any coordinator, whether you're an offensive or defensive coordinator, you know, you, you want to find out what are some new concepts out there? What are some new plays that I could do that we could do in the program? And, and that's where uh, Coach Jagosinski, you know, um, Pete Jennings was able to bounce things off him. You know, does that fit in? Do you think that'll fit into what we're doing? Okay, teach that to us. And, uh, um, and that was really, um, yeah, great benefit. Okay, so now we're, I'm going to start with this season's outlook, specifically with the offense. Um, you got Max Myler coming back, uh, Alex Peets back at running back. Um, still a little bit of a deep receiving core with some of the guys that decided to take that fifth year with uh, uh, Ryan Wisniewski and Little Kumaro, um, Derek Kumaro, uh, Tyler Holty, um, Sam Delaney. Um, and then I would think Jared Zausch is back as well, right? Yep, Jared and, uh, is back as well. And then uh, Kyle Gannon's anchoring that offensive line. Just kind of your thoughts on the offensive side of things. And then I'm going to throw a little bit of another question at you after that. Sure, sure. And I mean, and that's Max has been having a great camp. He, he had a great year last year. And you could just see his confidence in, in developing and, and, and uh, for, to get another year with your quarterback. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, that in itself, the, the guy that was playing for us in 2019 and then to be around in 2020 and working with that wide receiver core that you're talking about, that's a very talented group. Uh, it's a very talented group of people. And so for Max to be able to get that uh, another year with them and opportunities, and it's all timing. It's all timing with those guys, and, and it's getting to know each other and where they want the ball and when do they want the ball. And, and so, I mean, that's the stuff that, um, is so huge uh, in, in that aspect. Um, you know, Alex Pete at the running back position, goodness, um, I sort of got the guy's gotten even bigger. I mean, he, he, he's he, not that he was a huge guy before, but he is. Um, to have his maturity leading that running back core, um, and, and uh, you know, you're going to learn more about um, Jalen Edmondson. He's going to be a name you're going to get to know. Um, he was he was in we saw him a little bit in 2019 if I'm correct yeah, wasn't yeah. in the postseason a little bit yeah at least against St. John's yeah and so I mean Jay, yeah he had a great punt block um, he's now you'll see him running the ball more let's put it that way and, and uh, in all aspects it's great having Kyle Gannon in that offensive line room he's the leader of that he's the heart he's the pulse he's he, he really is he's a very cerebral guy very cerebral guy and, and looks at that and, and teaches the other players. He, he's a great teacher in the room. He's a great coach in the room as well um, and, and on the field with that core group. And so um, that, and that, that's that been a big piece that's been really helpful for us this past year is really developing that offensive line group. And, uh, um, and then obviously, yeah, you, you mentioned our, our wide receiver core, um, you know, Jared Zausch is kind of the conduit of that being the tight end in, in all reality. Um, you know, so he's a lineman, and, 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 uh, but yet, uh, he obviously, as a tight end, you got that dual role of wide receiver as a receiver and as a tight end, and uh, gives us a big target. Now, he is a big target, and, uh, and so, I mean, he adds another piece to that wide receiving core that we have in, in all reality. Um, yeah, and then you talk about that wide receiver core. I mean, um, man, I, I don't know. That's that's just one of the more talented groups I've been around in my coaching career, and um, and not a question. Ryan Wisniewski um, has really continued to develop himself. He, he is his process, the training, his process of preparation last year, and, and now in camp here, 
It's just fantastic. And uh, to have a guy that's whatever, uh, six foot four, and can run like him, and the strength that he has, um, physical strength, um, very thrilled and looking forward to his season. And yeah, and then you got, you got, you got Derek Kumaro, who, you know, um, is just fantastic and consistent and locked in, brings a great process to our program. And, uh, and then you got Holty, Ty Holty, Sam Delaney, um, that add into that group at that slot position, which those two guys are, you know, scatterbugs. Tough to get your hands on those guys after they catch a ball. Um, I guess any um, players that have either they were new, the lat, or any of the up underclassmen that we haven't heard names from yet that you think will impress some people on the offensive side? Sure, on the offensive side, I mean, you know, I've already mentioned, um, you know, um, Jalen Edmondson. There's no doubt you're going to get to know who that guy is. Um, there's no doubt about it. Uh, Zach Sherman, um, who's also a tight end for us, plays fullback as well. Um, he is a, uh, one of the most, you know, he's very, uh, you know, um, he's very athletic. He's very fast. I mean, he's a guy that could play linebacker. He could play, he's like Tony Gamina. Maybe that's the best way to explain it. He's a, he's a t Tony Gamina type tight end. Um, I mean, the, the guy is a decathlete. You know, big, fast, strong, explosive. I think that's a guy that uh, you're going to get to know his name a little bit better. Um, you know, for those young wide receivers, it's going to be tough to crack, crack that uh, crew that's in front of them. You know what I mean? And, and uh, um, you know, uh, Katzenberger will be a name that you're going to hear more of. And, and uh, he, he's a guy that uh, um, very, very good, what I would call possession receiver, very aggressive run blocker. Uh, so, I mean, it, Coach Jennings likes to use a lot of receivers. Let's put it that way. Okay, so here's the uh, other offensive question that I wanted to ask, but uh, I want to just kind of get confirmation about the um, – is do you have the nephew of um, Paul Christ in your program? I've heard something about that. Yeah, Jackson Christ is okay. um, has, uh, joined our program. Jackson has a quarterback. Um, Jackson is a freshman um, with eligibility and um, very excited to have him. He's the, um, his father is Jeep, who coaches at California. Uh, Jeep Chris and Jeep's coached in the NFL for many years and, and in college. And the, the Chris family has an amazing legacy, um, amazing legacy. You know, when you, you think about George Chris, the, the patriarch, and uh, um, there's no doubt Jackson's uh, continues that legacy. I mean, he's a student of the game and, and works his tail off. So here's where I was going to go with it because I've, I've thought about this. And I, you've had good one and two quarterbacks, but I thought you got Myler as your one, Evan Landowski, the former lacrosse quarterback um, that was at Maryland for a brief bit, and Jackson Chris. Is this going to be like the best, like top, like, in terms of the best, I'd say like a, in the NFL, they kind of say like quarterback room. Is this the best quarterback room that Whitewater has had in like a decade? Because the last like top one to three quarterbacks that I thought in terms of a quarterback room at Whitewater, I had to go all the way back to Blanchard, Brecky, and Matt Barrett year of 2011. Is this the yeah. best quarterback room since that? I mean, I, I'm, I don't know, you know, the, the best or the best ever. I, 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 those battles are tough to say. I, I can tell you one thing. I mean, there's other, another young man, Jason Sinetti, that's in that room, who's very talented as well. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's it, 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 a cannon, a freshman, um, and great name for a quarterback, cannon. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think Coach Jennings would say it might be one of the more talented groups he's ever been around. And uh, from top to bottom, top to bottom, that is uh, a really talented run. Okay. We're going to move over to the defensive side of things. Um, Mackenzie Blagnahi is another, is a, one of the standouts coming back. Nico Lemke from Mistosa Central um, is obviously back. Mark McGrath is one of the playmakers on, in, in that sec secondary. Tommy Matowska, um, just a couple guys to, to name. Um, Talk about the defense this year. Obviously, that's kind of your forte. 
Well, you know, and that's, you know, when you look at our defense, I think you kind of start with, um, you know, Mackenzie Bong and I um, up front. Um, he's a guy that uh, had an amazing year in 2019. Year in 2019, unfortunately, I think it was the second round of the playoffs. Um, he tore his ACL. And so he's a guy that, you know, uh, the year off last year might, might have been to his benefit in the sense of being able to rehab that. And uh, Mac is at full speed now, I can tell you that. I mean, and, and uh, he is in so many ways um, really the heart and soul of our D and, and is a leader in his action and a leader in his words in, in, in all reality. Um, you know, the next guy you got to jump into, I guess, jumping back to the back end is, is our field general. That's Mark McGrath. I mean, he, he's our safety that's making those calls and, and making those plays. And so, I mean, those two together really, uh, you know, they're both captains for us, um, give us some great leadership on that defense. Um, you know, coming out of the 2019 season, we graduated a number of of seeing, you know, guys that were seniors in there. So we were going to have a lot to replace in 2020. And, and I guess if there's one advantage again to not maybe um, is, is the preparation that we had in getting a lot of our young guys ready. And Mac, and, you know, um, Mark and, and Tommy Matoska have really um, been kind of that core leadership group for us in, in developing um, over this past year. I'm very excited about that defense. This will be Coach Randall's first year as a defensive coordinator. Well, first season, excuse me. Um, you know, so this will be his second year of being our coordinator. And uh, um, that's going to be an exciting group. And I, I chew that you mentioned Nico Lemke. I so apologize there. I mean, Nico's explosive. I mean, he's, he is a ball of fire. And uh, he's bigger. He's, he's put on some sides here during over the year. And so, I mean, that's, uh, um, we'll see. We're excited about the development of our defense over the year and, and uh, over this past year. You were talking about Jay Strindall. He's, he, was he the linebacker coach before this? Yeah, Jay's okay. coach, coach LBs. Okay, so like, um, how is that transition going from kind of being one of the position coaches to being the defensive coordinator as we Rob left for, what was it, South Dakota or? Yeah, Rob went to South Dakota State, um, and great, great move, great opportunity for him to be with Coach Stiglmeyer's staff and a great program, great tradition. Um, you know, it's it's a natural fit. I mean, when I came here in 2008 um, as the D-line coach, um, I was really kind of responsible for the front eight. And, um, and Jason was one of those, that's when he was a senior. And I can remember as I got to know him and understand him and see who he was, uh, I can remember saying to Brian Bohr, and I go, that guy's going to be a D coordinator someday. I go, he gets it. He understands that all the pieces of the puzzle come together. And that's probably the most important part for a coordinator offensively and defensively is that they just have a great grasp and understanding of how the pieces of the puzzle come together and work in a fluid manner. It is. Every play is a fluid manner of how those pieces of the puzzle come together. They don't always come together in the same way in each play. Um, and he had an understanding of that back then. I, I mean, very unique that a player understands and had that, you know, and that's why Coach Leipold hired him as a um, graduate assistant. And um, he was one of my first hires when I got the job. And, and uh, Jace at that time was at the University of South Dakota. And uh, um, he was one of my first phone calls when I got the job. And uh, so the, his transition has been, I think he had the pedigree for it. And the, the thing that's been really good in the last six years and, and, you know, prior to him being the coordinator, being at the linebacker position is, is really beautiful for a person that wants to uh, be a coordinator because the linebackers are the conduit between the line front in the back end with the DBs. And um, so the knowledge that you learn being a linebacker coach, you have to know both ends of the scheme. And, and, and you're obviously, because your crew is in the middle of it and they tie in with both groups and, and being that conduit, um, I think has been, or I know has been very good preparation for uh, yeah. Coach Randall. 
I guess a following up follow up question on that would be, um, obviously, what what do, how how much is it benefited, um, Jace from well, one playing under Borland, um, being on on the position staff with on the defensive side with under Borland, to being on the on the deep on the defensive staff under Erickson. How much is that kind of per? Uh, I guess in the word prepared him for this opportunity. You know, and that's um, that's a great that's a great question, Daniel. That's a very good question. And um, first and foremost, it's and I can tell you this just from my own experiences. Whether it was, you know, my first coaching job was with um, Stan Zweifel as a head coach. I worked with John O'Grady for 15 years worked for, with Lance um, or under Lance for seven years, you learn, you learn, you learn so much from people like that. And, and, and that's the same thing I can say confident for Jace is the opportunity to learn from uh, Brian Borland as a player and as a coach. Um, and then obviously being a coach with Rob. So, I mean, it's been great preparation. I think the thing that's, um, uh, this may even sound really strange. Uh, this may sound, Jace has a great grasp of the standards and expectations of our process. And because he experienced it as a player, he experienced it as a GA, he experienced it as a position coach. So, I mean, that to me is an unbelievable, uh, it's a fantastic strength to have. And, and that's something I mean, when I even hire within my staff, Ryan Cortez, Bo Martin, Marcus McClan, you know, Brent Allen, um, those are guys that play ball here. And, and this is a very special place. And I don't want to sound arrogant or, or cocky, but to have experienced it, to have experienced it from a player's perspective, uh, the, the standard of what we expect of ourselves and each other, and then to be able to go teach it um, is is really an advantage, and, and and that's and that's why I love hiring those types of men, those types of people. Okay, we're gonna jump over to the the season schedule. Obviously, um, the non conference schedule has got to be kind of one of the most competitive that you guys have had in a while. Um, Carthage yeah. kind of took Oshkosh to the brink a couple times. Um, in, in the non-conference schedule the last couple of years. Um, you got Barry, who made the playoffs, um, I think, in 2019. Um, mm -hmm. Just kind of talk about that non-conference schedule, and usually you're trying to scrape for um, some team to kind of play against you, especially some NAI um, games. You know, you had a, one year you had some, a really good NAI game against Morningside. Um, just kind of, um, obviously this year it's more of, you got all, yeah, all three of your non-conference opponents are all Division three teams, so that's got to be a great thing. Um, just got, talk about that non-conference schedule to start. You bet. I mean, and that's um, – it, it may be. It, it, I know since I've been here, this may be the most um, competitive non-conference schedule that we've had. I mean, uh, Carthage, the game. I mean, they're playing a very good league, and they're playing very good. Um, Coach Haas doing a great job. Um I, I, I knew his dad and coached with his dad in summer camps and stuff. So I remember seeing him when he was just a little guy. Well, he's now, uh, we're playing him and he's got a heck of a program. I That's delivered pizza. I delivered pizza to him in Kenosha and I was wearing all white water gear and he was not too thrilled about that. <laughs> I, I guess I can't blame him. I can't, blame him, but I'm sure he still enjoyed the pizza. Um, but uh, no. And then, and then obviously Barry, um, uh, they coach has built a, a heck of a program there. And then Salisbury, I mean, goodness gracious, we played them in the national playoffs. I mean, those two teams, it's not uncommon. They're making it into the second round or have made it in the second round of the national playoffs. It, it's going to be a dog fight. I'm excited about it. We're excited about it. I mean, it's, it's considering we didn't have any games last year. Let's play some games. Let's play some games and let's see where we're at and let's develop ourselves. And that's, that's what really happens, um, Daniel. It, it, it's our, our goal is to win the WIC Conference Championship. We say at the beginning of the year, we say it one time, and, I, and I've said that at our first team meeting. 
we know what it is. Those non-conference games are our preparation for that. That doesn't um, mean we take them lightly by any means, but it just, it is the greatest learning is going to happen um, after game one. Then there's going to be a huge learning curve coming into after the game two and the game three. And then obviously after game three, I mean, it's, it's the thing that you, as a coach, you want to find out where your weaknesses are. You want to find out where your strengths are. You want to find out what do we need to fix? Uh, what do we need to build on? And these three games, um, win or lose, we're going to come out of those three games knowing what we need to do. And, and, and that, to me, is the exciting part of it. And, uh, um, yeah, I mean, by rights, you know, you mentioned the scheduling thing. It's really tough for us to find games. I mean, it is really, really, no. And it's when I say us, I, I'm saying WIC, actually. Our, our whole conference, the, the ability, to, uh, the inability to have people that want to play us, it's terribly unique. It's really a reflection of, of, of the talent and play that's in our league. And, and our league is tough as nails, and it's going to be, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun fall. It really is. Um, we'll jump to the the conference side of things. Obviously, um, the last time you guys played, Oshkosh was the other team that made the postseason. I know they had maybe a freshman quarterback the last time, so that guy's probably gotten some um, good more experience to kind of grow mm -hmm. off of. What's the outlook on the conference this year, even though everybody's kind of gone through this COVID thing and, and they had to deal with everything? What's kind of that outlook on that? If, you gosh, know, gosh. The, the first thing I would say is anybody in our conference can beat anybody. They can. I mean, that, that is on any given Saturday. I think that's why, you know, I mean, we say it, but it's, and it's real. It's the best kind athletic conference in the country at division three i mean it's not just football it's it's every other sport as well um everybody else is going to be in a similar boat to us in the sense that we had we got some fifth year players playing ball and so the level of play that you're going to see in our league this year uh, i'm predicting is going to be just fantastic i mean my point is for you fans out there go to a wic game because it is going to be fun um, it, it really is, and, and we're excited to get the perk packed on September 4th. And, and uh, no, it's, but I'm not going to sit here and predict our league, Daniel. I've coached in this league since 1990. Um, predicting is probably not the right thing to do. <laughs> you know, it really isn't because it's, it's, uh, it's, there's such a fine line between who comes out on top and, and, and who doesn't in each game and, and to, to predict our league i can't do it and i won't do it um because it's it's uh all i know is i gotta concentrate on taking care of us today and, and get ready for my next meeting get ready for my next meeting and see if we can get better in that meeting okay so this next thing is a unique thing that um just got added this year um and it's going to be between the two obviously the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Athletic Conference and the other one of the other best conferences in all Division Three. We talked kind of how Carthage is in in that in that other conference in the CCIW. Can you just kind of talk about your initial thoughts about this inaugural bowl game that is going to happen yeah. this year at Verona? The, the Isthmus Bowl. And yeah. So basically, it's it's not a new concept. Um, it's new to our conference. Um, I know the NSIC and, and, the, and the conference uh, at Division Two; those are Division Two schools. That it's basically this: um, whoever does, whoever has the highest place in the team in the conference at the end of the season, um, but doesn't go to the national playoffs, will play in the Isthmus Bowl. So, um, you know, we've been fortunate in our league for our second place team to often go to the national playoffs. Um, so it could be our third place team, but let's say could our be like place could team be like a lacrosse, well. could be like a lacrosse versus Carthage, you know, thing, right? Yeah. And and so I mean, it, but it could be a second place team. Um, it's just whoever has the highest place that does not go to the national playoffs will play in the Isthmus Bowl. It's a great opportunity. You know, when you think about it, Daniel, our kids. This this is really amazing. Our kids don't get scholarships. 
our kids train year round. I think some people think, oh, it's like high school. They just kind of show up in the fall and we, you know, work them into shape. No, these kids train year round. Um, and, and they train at a level that is, is amazing. And, and uh, they get one more game, one more game. They only get 10. They only get given 10. And to get one more game, that's huge. One more opportunity for those kids to play and, and uh, uh, that's ultimately what it's all about. So I, I'm excited, excited for the SMS ball, excited uh, that the idea was brought up and, and the CCIW and the WIC are going to be playing one on the, um, I guess the 12th week of the season is what it would be. Okay. I know I, I um, asked the um, underclassmen question with the offense, where there's some un underclassmen on the defensive side that you um, see a lot of good things out of this year. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, wow. Um, yeah, um, Egan Hine, you're going to, that's, he's, Egan's one of our corners. Uh, we got Tommy on one side, Egan on the other side. Um, you're going to get to know his name. Tall, long, athletic. He was a safety for us back in 2019. Um, due to his athleticism, we are like, man, we got to move him to corner. And um, we moved him over to corner. He played some spot play in 2019 as a true freshman. Um, so you're gonna get to know his name, Aaron Sturdivant. Um, Burlington kid. Yeah, one of our linebackers. I mean, you're gonna get to know um, Aaron's name um, a little bit more um, in the defensive line. I mean, uh, Kyle Gallagher, um, you know, we got a freshman that, uh, you know, may, may get himself in a position to be playing as well, Matt Burbo. Um, and I shouldn't say he's a freshman, he was with us last year. So, I mean, he's an eligibility freshman, but he's with us for a second year. Um, those are some names that you, you're going to learn more about during the course of the season. Is it all right to ask about, um, I, I don't know what the status of Morgan Carpenter and then I, obviously Aiden Calderon are both kids I covered at Palmar Eagle or are they, where do they fit in any of that? Or they're, not, they're not with us at this time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just thought I'd ask that. Um, okay, so what's the uh, COVID protocols um, for the football games this year, and then will there be full crowds? Um, from my understanding, there'll be full crowds. Okay. I mean, hopefully nothing changes with that. And uh, um, But uh, you know as much as I right now if there's any other protocols. Um, I, I, I don't know of any others at this time. But again, as we all know, this uh, last year and a half has been very fluid with how things change. Okay. Um, now we're going to go from Warhawk football to some professional um, football with this next little section of things. Um, Kumaros with the Bills getting some good hype from uh, Josh Allen right now. Obviously, Quinn got drafted in the third round. Obviously, you're up in his jersey. Um, Matt Barrett is the offensive coordinator with the Green Bay Blizzard. Um, and then famous Hasty, one of the best names probably in all of Warhawk football history, is with what Sioux Falls in the indoor league. Um, what and obviously there's other names you can kind of throw out in terms of maybe some of the college coaching side of things. I know Tommy Coughlin's with some program um, on, on a coaching staff. So, what do these kind of successes mean to the program? It's awesome. Um, to me, it's um, the coolest part of it is an opportunity to play the game you love. It's, been, it's an opportunity for them to play the game they love or coach the game they love. And, and um, shoot, I never left the game. I, I went to college and never left college. You know, Dan, I mean, I, I'm one of those guys. I, I did graduate. I just stayed here. And um, that to me is so cool. And, and for famous and, and Jake and Quinn and, and uh, those guys to be able to continue to uh, love playing the game they play. I mean, you look at it, uh, you know, I, I, my best analogy to it is, is, is really Brett Favre. I mean, Brett Favre, um, he didn't need any more money after he got done playing for the Packers. He didn't need to keep on playing. He loved playing. He loved being in the locker room. He loved being around the team. He loved the competition. Um, yeah, 
it's it's a love of the sport. It's a love of the sport and of a sport. And, and, and that to me is really cool, Daniel, and people can continue to do that, build on that. Does it help our program? Yes, to, to have Quinn in the NFL and, and those things, um, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. And, and, and there isn't a uh, young person that doesn't probably touch a football and play football and, and start to grow a passion and love for it that, that think that that's where they want to be. And so it's it's very cool to see some kid from Hartford, Wisconsin, and uh, play for the Warhawks in the NFL. And the same thing with, you know, Jay Kumaro. And, and so, I mean, that, that's, there's no doubt. Um, that's a dream. And, and it's a great dream. And, and, uh, and UW Whitewater is a place where people can chase that dream. I guess a follow-up question to that is how does – how big was it, obviously, for Quinn to go in the third round, but then how much motivation is it to guys like, obviously, Ryan Wisniewski is on that senior bowl watch list. So what, how, how much motivation is it to him, too? Not a question. I mean, and just to learn from somebody like Quinn and learn his process of how he went about things on a daily basis. And that, that's been great growth for whether it's Ryan Wisniewski or Derek Kumaro and the, and the other guys that want that, that have those dreams. And, um, and so, I mean, it's, and it's reaffirming. Again, it reaffirms to them that it can be done. It can be done. And, and uh, we've got a lot of times people, um, as we both know, um, you know, doubt division three, doubt division two and, and, and everything's, um, you know, power five FBS. Uh, there's a lot of talent, a lot of talented football players around this country. As we kind of speak of F FBS, obviously your predecessor, Lance Leipold, is now at Kansas. Um, I guess what were your thoughts on that move? But the the big question here is what's the biggest thing that you learned from Lance? Uh, the biggest thing I learned from him, buddy. So obviously, I was, I was an that's, pro, and you both have that's, similar that's a program. That's question, lost. buddy, because I've learned so much from him. And and I mean that in all I mean that in sincerity. I mean I've learned so much from him. If I had to pick one thing, um, standard of process, a consistent high standard of process, individually, collectively, making that happen, and and um, and that's selling him short. How much he's taught. I, I mean it is, but that that may be the most important piece of everything that he's taught me in all reality. I'm excited for Lance, I'm excited for Jim Zabrowski, Andy Kotelnicki, Brian Borland, Chris Simpson, the, those guys that were Warhawks here and, and are there. Um, they've shown that they can build, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of times people think when Lance came to UW Whitewater, yeah, Coach Breslitz had built up uh, a great foundation. Him and Coach Perk had built this foundation of an amazing program. And, and Lance kept on building. That's the cool thing. That, that's the thing. That's the thing that, that Lance kept on building on that foundation. And, and my responsibility to them and, and past Warhawks is to continue to build. And, and, and um, it's not maintained. It's never maintained. And, and I'm just telling you. So my point is, Lance built here. He built at Buffalo. He's going to build at Kansas. And, and the, it's not even a question. It's not even a doubt to that. And, and he's got the right people around him to uh, do that. Yes, this first year, it's going to be tough. It is. It takes time to build good things. And, and, um, but they will build it. I guess the unique thing about both of you um, would be the program philosophy, because obviously you, you guys constantly say get 1% better each day. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing that plastered all over on the Kansas football side now. Um, so I guess you guys both kind of share that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, um, I didn't invent it. I don't know who invented it, but we took it and implemented it. And, and that's something that was, that's been here a long time. And, and, um, and, and Lance has made that a, a key piece of what they do and did at Buffalo and, and uh, what they continue to do. And that, that, that ties in, that 1% ties into the building process of, of, like I said, 
the standard of building process. So I've got to continue to push to get a little bit better each day. Okay, I'm going to keep Leipold in here with this as we're going to get away from football for a little bit. Sure. Um, this this year is a unique year for you because um, your daughter is starting off her college volleyball career at um, in California at Cal State Poly. Um, I guess in, in addition to that, Lance has a daughter who is a senior at Stetson on the volleyball program over there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how are you going to manage – kind of coaching the Warhawks in terms of the football program and then kind of still kind of trying to keep tabs on how your daughter's doing on the volleyball side of things over there. And then has Lance given you any advice on how to go about, um, about that as well? Well, I haven't asked Lance. I probably need to, I guess my, um, thank God for, uh, you know, uh, ESPN plus, cause then I'll be able to, uh, log in and watch some, uh, Cal Poly volleyball games at, uh, nine o'clock at night. So, um, so I'm going to have to get used to staying up a little bit later than I normally do, Daniel. So, um, I'm, I'm very proud of her as Lance is very proud of Lindsay. And, and I know Lindsay's in her last year, um, at Stetson and, uh, um, it's, uh, it's amazing time. And, and, uh, if we have to enjoy those experiences through video, uh, you know, obviously I won't be flying out to Cal Poly to watch any games. Uh, we've got some things to manage here, but uh, no, it, it's uh, um, very excited for those young ladies. Okay, so here's the a little bit of a hypothetical, even though it's probably very unlikely with how division vo division one volleyball is. With obviously Wisconsin's a, a national power, Penn State's a national power in volleyball. Nebraska is pretty good. Uh, so this next little question is with, and as far as I know, Stetson and Cal State Poly are not on the schedule. Um, but let's say postseason happens and the two teams have to face each other. Would there be a wager between you and Lance in terms of that matchup and like who whoever wins would have to buy, or like if Lance's daughter won, you would have to go and buy him Culver's or something like that would would there be a wager like that you know if that happens i guarantee you there'll be uh some friendly rager but obviously now i neither one of us can gamble so i mean it, it'll you know it's an ncaa thing um daniel but uh there's no doubt that would be uh that'd be cool that'd be really cool to say the least daniel okay all right this last question obviously the wisconsin football coaches association um Hall of Fame just announced the Hall of, the Hall of Fame inductees for next year. Um, I know that Forrest Perkins is in that Hall of Fame. I would assume Bob Rezowitz is. Um, Lance is in that. He was inducted a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if Borland is in there, yes. but I, I know yep. uh, John O'Grady is in there as well. Yep. Um, yeah, throw another Whitewater connection in there. Jeff Sizer is in there as a reporter. Um, yep. Just kind of what does that honor mean to you? You know, it's it's really, um, it's very humbling. The first thing is, Daniel, it's very humbling. And because um, in all reality, I mean, I, I, I've spent basically my career coaching in the state of Wisconsin. And yes, I spent some time at Minnesota Morris when I was a student coach there. And, and, and I stayed with Adolphus for a couple of years in Minnesota. Um, but really since 1990, I've been here and, and uh, the, I guess I, I think of Wisconsin football and I think of the great coaches that have been in the state and at college and at high school. Um, it, it's very humbling to, to be in that group and, and uh, um, uh, kind of hard to believe, kind of hard to believe, to be honest with you. I, I don't know if I'll believe it uh, um, until even the induction. To be honest with you, because it's uh, learned a lot from a lot of those people uh, that are in there, and uh, there's many others. I have Steve Dinkle's in there, um, you know. So I mean, it, there's a lot of old Warhawks in that, and, and uh, others that I've had a chance to learn from. I guess do you get to do like some sort of speech and 
<laughs> I, I would throw a joke in, I'd throw a joke in here because I know yeah. like you use, you use um, the word candid a lot. And I remember watching your press conference and you used it like six, six total times in your introduction press conference. Well, so, I've attended the banquet, which is an amazing banquet that the WFCA puts on. Um, it really is. It's the pomp and circumstance and the experience for everybody involved is it's uh, really cool. Um, but I don't get to give a speech because I would talk way too long. And, and uh, you get a coach talking in front of a group, we all talk too long. Okay. Um, I guess if you want to, like, I, I guess to end things, um, any, like, what's your best story with Leipold? My best story with Coach Leipold? Wow. Wow. I can, I'll tell you a funny story. There was one time I, we were coaching, I was, when I was coaching D-line for him, I probably shouldn't even tell this story because it's kind of embarrassing. And I cannot remember what happened, but the official made a call and I went out on the field, which don't do that. Don't do that. That's not a smart assistant move, but I, I was, uh, I was a little, a little angry, I guess. Next thing I know, somebody grabbed my hoodie. I had a hoodie on and they're dragging me back to the sideline. Who do you think that was? Coach Leipold. That was Coach Leipold. He was putting me back in the coach's box. And uh, I remember I looked at him, and he's like, Kevin, you gotta relax, buddy. And I was like, yep, that was good head coaching. Let's put it that way. That was good head coaching. Didn't need to take a flag. Okay. Um, I guess one of the other things, I know in another podcast, you were talking about how marching band um can help with football um can you kind of go a little bit more into that and then obviously um talk about maybe the relationship that you would have with the marching band director at whitewater yeah you know glenn hayes is there doc hayes um or his nickname is purple hayes um we're, we're good friends glenn and i are very good friends there's always been a great relationship between warhawk football and our marching band when you come to a warhawk game it's not uh, it's not just football there's the there's the band, which is an amazing top echelon band uh, marching on that field. But there's also an amazing tailgate that's on that field, and and it just adds to that entire experience. I was actually when I was in high school, I was a marching band. Uh, I was a tuba player, so um, so I have a great appreciation for those tuba guys. I got to carry that big tuba. Was it one of the overhead ones, or was it the sousaphone? Uh, I was a sousaphone. Okay. A wrap around. Yep. And so, I mean, but I, I'll tell you this, the discipline, and, and that's really, you know, you talk about what's the value of that. It, it's a discipline. It's the discipline. A band playing together is no different than a football team or a basketball team or a baseball team. And it, it's, it's assertive. It's aggressive. It is discipline. It is detailed. Uh, it, it is uh, synchronized. It, 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 it is awesome. And, and the discipline I learned being in band and in choir, I was also in choir, um, really to me helped me, you know, be as good an athlete as I could be. And I was, now, I was pretty average in college football player, I will tell you that. Okay. I was going to add about the sousaphone and how it was originally, it wasn't ever, wasn't originally the cup that we do see originally when Sousa designed that, it was actually upwards, I guess. And they usually call them like rain catchers. Um, I know that. Yeah. So, all right, coach. Um, um, thanks for letting me have you on. Um, best of luck this season. Um, I'm sure I'll see you at some games, especially the, the first one. Um, and go Warhawks. Thanks, Daniel. It's been a pleasure, bud. All right. Yep. Bye-bye.